Hello everybody, hope you're doing well and thanks for joining us for another video. As most of you are probably aware, I recently returned from Antarctica as part of the final experiment to see the 24 hours sun, which I will argue completely decimates any notion of the Earth being flat. Now, it does seem many flat earthers are still struggling with how this trip actually constituted an experiment, because they're arguing it's only an observation, because they don't understand what the variables are. Well, we didn't just watch to see if there was a 24-hour sun, we did much more than that, such as measuring the distances between lines of longitude at various locations, testing the shadow lengths at Union Glacier, and the main one that I was doing was solar photography. I had my equatorial mount set up, which allowed my camera to stay aligned with the sun and regularly take photographs. Now, aligning that mount was a bit of a ball ache, because typically you align it at night using the stars near the celestial pole as a reference. But setting it up during the day obviously makes that a lot harder because you can't see the celestial pole. So I wound up having to go by trial and error. We worked out where due south was using our GPS coordinates, so I knew where to aim the mount. Then you have to set the elevation to match your latitude, which in our case was 79 degrees. After that, it was essentially a case of memorize where the sun was in the viewfinder, wait a few minutes and then check it again. If the sun had moved left or right in the frame, then the direction of the mount wasn't quite true south. If it rose or dropped, then the elevation of the mount was off. Now, I'd mentioned in one of the videos I did before I left home that I wasn't completely confident I'd be able to get the thing tracking properly during a daytime setup. So I did a practice run while we were in Punta Arenas before we flew to Antarctica, just to try and get my eye in rather than going completely unprepared. Again, we'd worked out where the north-south line of sight was to know which direction to point the mount. The elevation angle in Punta Arenas was about 53 degrees. And apart from a slight oversight on my part that I'd left the EQ mount speed set to track the stars rather than the sun, so it wasn't tracking properly to begin with, but once that was rectified, I was happy that getting an alignment in Antarctica would be manageable with enough trial and error. And sure enough, it took about an hour of fine tuning, but I eventually got to a point where left to right was holding perfectly. There was still a slight vertical drift though, but I didn't want to push my luck too much and risk making things worse. So I decided I'd just leave it as it was and I'd keep an eye on it. Hence, I couldn't get any sleep. I mean, it was concerning enough when we had to leave the site for like 90 minutes to go back to the main camp for meals. The first thing I did every time we got back, as soon as I got out of the truck, I went straight over to the camera to check if the sun was still in view and then recenter it to get rid of any drift. So I didn't dare risk going to sleep because if I'd slept for too long and the sun drifted out of frame, that would arguably be game over. So instead, I wound up staying up for some 47 hours without sleep. In endless daylight, it really does mess with your head. I was never really sure what time of day it was, much less what the actual day was. Thankfully, though, I think having internet access through the Starlink helped a lot. It, it gave me some sense of time because I was able to video call family back home. That gave me a frame of reference because I was saying goodnight to the kids who were about to go to bed. Plus, it helped keep me occupied and distracted because I could still access all of the comments that you guys were making on videos. I was picking up the emails from people who were sending me sunspot photos, which I'll get on to shortly. And it even allowed me to keep my streak of using Brilliant.org alive. A few people had asked on this trip, how was I going to keep my streak going in Antarctica? And I said, as long as I had internet access, I'd find a way. Well, I did. I'm now over 640 consecutive days of using Brilliant.org. Now, regular viewers of this channel know how much I recommend Brilliant as a simple and effective way to expand your knowledge. And their maths classes definitely helped keep me awake and alert whilst I was in Antarctica. I might even be the first person ever to use Brilliant on the seventh continent. 
but obviously it's much nicer to use it in the warmth and comfort of your own home. If you don't believe me, try it for yourself by grabbing a 30-day free trial using my link brilliant.org forward slash Dave McKeegan, and doing so will entitle you to 20% off their annual subscription. Now, just in case anyone is wondering, this particular time-lapse footage of the setup period wasn't in the 25-minute version that I posted it online because it wound up being a separate video file. I'd set my 360 camera up at first so that it could record me setting up the EQ mount as well as setting up Will's two 360 cameras, but Will then expressed some concern that I'd maybe placed my 360 camera too close to the EQ mount and that at some point during the day they might wind up obscuring each other's views of the sun. So I stopped my 360 recording, moved the tripod slightly further apart and then started it again. Now, whilst I was going through the EQ mount alignment, I was taking occasional photos. Once I was happy that the alignment was pretty much spot on, I then set the camera into intervalometer shooting where it would take one photo every 60 seconds. Now, a few flat earthers spotted what they think is a sign of this all being faked because towards the end of the first time lapse that I posted, you see the sun beginning to shine down the side of the camera lens. In fact, what actually happened here is the EQ mount begun reversing direction whilst I was distracted doing the live stream. So I didn't even notice this until the camera had long lost sight of the sun. Now, it seems odd at first as to why it would do that, but likely it's one of two reasons. Some people have suggested that these EQ mounts have basically an automatic safety feature where they will reverse direction after about 360 degrees to prevent cables from wrapping around them which does seem to fit because the camera seems to reverse direction in roughly the same uh, place that it was when it started the time lapse in the first place or else if it wasn't that the white power cable that's feeding into my camera does appear to start becoming tight now, if that was snagging around the EQ mount, that would have added extra resistance against the mount, which could then have triggered it to start reversing. Either way, that is why the sun was shining down the side of the lens. It's not some failed CGI bodge job by the folks at NASA. But this reversal of direction happened after more than 24 hours worth of shots of the sun. So we have solar photos spanning more than a 24 hour period. Now, the camera was my Sony a7 III, fitted with the Tamron 150-500mm to lens, and I had it set to a 500mm focal length. I also then had a solar filter on the front of it from KNF Concept, and this setup wound up capturing more than 1,200 photos of the sun. And here is a time-lapse of the photos that it captured. I think this is crazy that you can actually see the focus drifting in and out, which I suspect is due to the temperature fluctuations. Because I manually focused the lens at the very start, but then I just left the focus alone. So changing temperature within the lens would cause the focus to change slightly. Now, just to give some clarity on this time lapse. Firstly, all of the original photos are publicly available. I've uploaded them to a folder on Google Drive, which is linked down below in the description. But all of these original files are ARW file extensions, which is Sony RAW camera format, meaning you will need the relevant codecs to access the files, likely from some sort of photo editing software. But I appreciate most people probably don't have that. So I'm also going to export all of the originals as a JPEG format as well, which I'll put into a subfolder. So anybody can easily access the images if you go to the JPEGs. And if for some reason you're skeptical that the JPEG images might have been tampered with, then you still have the RAWs to cross-reference against, but you'll need to find a way to open them. Now, for the time-lapse, as I mentioned previously, the alignment of the EQ mount wasn't completely perfect. The first few images were just odd grabs during setup. Even once the camera was consistently taking photos, though, the sun was still drifting vertically through the frame, and occasionally I had to recenter the in the viewfinder. 
Now that as a time lapse alone would have just then had the sun bouncing around the frame, which would have been hard for people to watch. So the solution is to center every image on the sun to keep it in the middle of the frame throughout. Although with over 1200 images taken, that would have taken a long time for me to do manually. So, whilst we were all in Santiago airport waiting to fly back home, MC Toon kindly took some time to put together a little program script for me that automatically centered and cropped all of the photos to give the time lapse that you see here. And he was also able to get it to display the time and date information from each of the file's EXIF data and display it on the screen so that you can see the GMT time that the images were taken. Well, almost. Looking at the camera now, it seems that it's set to about 10 minutes behind GMT, but it's near enough. I thought I'd just clarify all of this because you'll notice in the time lapse there are at least two occasions where there's faded spots moving across the sun, and some people might be questioning what those are. Simply, those are dust spots from the camera sensor. They appear in the same place in every shot, but obviously the sun is moving throughout the various shots, and then the time lapse is being centered on the sun. That's causing the sun to stay in the same place in the frame, meaning the dust spots will appear to move in and out of view. But anyway, there are a few key things that this time lapse does show. Firstly, to clarify, it's not an observation. It's a series of observations over the course of a full day. So time is one of the independent variables. And the focal length of the camera was left constant. So we are able to see how the sun's angular size varies throughout the course of the day. Or in this case, how it doesn't because its angular size remains constant throughout the day. This allows us to confirm that the distance between the sun and the camera does not vary by any perceivable amount throughout the day. Now, if you were to go with a typical flat Earth concept, where the North Pole is in the center and Antarctica is away from the center, and that the sun is fairly local, we should expect to see the size of the sun vary because the distance from the observer would be constantly changing. Or else, if it's circling around Antarctica, then the sun in the north should be constantly changing, and we don't see that either. Another thing that we can take from this time lapse is that the sunspots remain in the same place throughout the day. I've heard some suggestions from people that what we actually observed when the sun was south of our location in Antarctica was in fact a reflection of the sun off the firmament. The, the sun in the north was the actual sun, but by the time that it had moved around to the south, we were just seeing a reflection. However, if that were the case, then at some point during that time lapse, the sunspots would have mirrored, because reflections mirror things. So if we were observing both the actual sun and a reflection of the sun at different points during a 24-hour period, the reflected sun would have displayed mirrored sunspots versus the actual sun, which we don't see. Now, I managed to get one straight photo of the sun with the solar filter on in Punta Arenas, but it's pretty clear that the sun we viewed in Punta Arenas is the same sun we viewed in Antarctica. Although, for reference, I've also taken this photo just this morning from here in the UK with the exact same setup that I used in Antarctica. Sony a7 III with the Tamron lens set to 500mm. And the winter sun here in the UK appears the exact same size in the sky as the summer sun we viewed in both Antarctica and Punta Arenas. And in Punta Arenas, we were consistently watching the sun rise from the southeast, circle around us to the north, and then set in the southwest. And you could even see the glow of twilight move across the horizon in the south until the next sunrise. Add to that, I posted a full time-lapse video of the flight from Punta Arenas to Antarctica. And even though you can't see the sun itself through that video, you can see clear reflections of it in the plane's engines. Now, if there was a second sun, or the position of the sun suddenly changed, then the shadows being cast on the engine would have suddenly changed, but they didn't. However, the biggest thing to come from this time-lapse, the thing that for me personally 
frankly just throws a grenade into the idea of the Earth being flat, is that we'd made it publicly known for weeks before this trip on my channel, the Final Experiments channel, MC Toon's channel, all in the weeks building up to it, we let everybody know that we would be taking solar photos in Antarctica. And we all actively encouraged anybody with the equipment and the ability to do so to go and capture photos of the sunspots at the same time. Make a note of where and when they were taken and then email them over to us. And you guys did not disappoint. I mean, we were receiving sunspot photos from people that were capturing them before we'd even flew to Antarctica, and I was still getting new ones through after we got back to Punta Arenas, which is incredible. You guys absolutely went above and beyond, so a big thank you to everybody who helped out with that. Now, a few people who were sending the images through did specifically ask to remain anonymous, and whilst they provided their exact GPS uh, locations for reference, they understandably don't want that information publicly shared. So just for people's peace of mind and safety, I've rounded down the GPS locations for each of the photos down to one decimal place, and I've just given a general location on the screen as a reference marker. I've also adjusted the time so that they're all now in GMT so that they correspond to the timestamps recorded from my camera in the time lapse. Now, most of the images that show clear views of the sunspots that were taken during the period that I was capturing photos as well seem to have come from various locations across North America. And comparing all of them with each other, you can see a pretty consistent pattern of three prominent sunspots forming a triangle that points upwards and is located on the right-hand side of the sun. Yet, if we compare all of those to the photos that I took in Antarctica, we can see that from Union Glacier, what we were seeing was those same three sunspots forming a triangle on the left-hand side of the sun pointing down. A complete 180-degree rotation. Not completely different sunspots, like we're viewing the opposite side of the sun or a different sun entirely, not mirrored sunspots like we're viewing a reflection, a full 180 degree rotation like the observers are almost inverted to each other. But just to further drive that point home, I did also receive at least one photo from somebody who was also in the southern hemisphere as we were. This was taken from Tasmania, south of Australia at nearly 43 degrees south latitude. And from their vantage point, the sunspots still form a triangle, but to them, they're pointing from the left to the right of the sun at a downward angle, essentially partially rotated. Now, to be clear, this alone is its own experiment. It's not an observation like flat earthers might claim. This has an independent variable. The changing observer's location is an independent variable, and seeing then how does that change affect the relative position of the sunspots? Obviously, now moving forward, the big question for anybody has to be, how are those sunspot comparisons explained on whatever version of Earth you subscribe to? And for me personally, there is no tangible explanation for seeing rotated sunspots at the same time from various locations across a flat plain with a even remotely local sun. They all instead point to a globe with a far away sun. But I suppose time will tell as to what explanation flat earthers can come up with, if any. As always though, feel free to leave your thoughts in the comments down below. If you've enjoyed this video and you haven't already done so, then please consider hitting the like and subscribe buttons and hopefully we'll see you in the next video.